Well, once again, good morning, uh, Trinity, and any friends who are joining with us. Uh, good, even if these are strange situations we meet, but it's good <coughs> that we can meet together. Um, just by way of uh, an introduction, perhaps, as we uh, look back over the last 50 years of church life here in Western Europe and in America, um, I think we've become quite blessing orientated with um, the thrust of the teaching that generally the church in the West has received. And in demanding times like this, we can still be seeking the Lord to bless us and he is looking to us for discipline. Um, and that causes uh, conflict of interest, I suppose. <laughs> um, for those who weren't with us last week, we started a series uh, of four messages from a place of distress to a place of delight. It is based on Psalm 118, verse 5. From my distress or narrow place, I called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me in the large place. We said that this verse was the picture of the shofar, that when we blow into the narrow end, this wonderful expanding note comes out of the other. And this, we said, was linked to the large place of Rehoboth in Genesis 22, a broad, fruitful place to flourish. And we started last time in a series looking at four narrow places of distress. Last week we looked at confinement and the importance of worship. This morning we will look at the place of constriction and the importance of the word. Uh, next month, I think it is, we will look at the place of confusion and the importance of our wills. And the next time we meet, it will be the place of contrition where we are worn down and the importance of waiting. Uh, last week, we said Paul and Silas, um, though they were in prison, the Lord was more real to them than their circumstances and they worshipped the Lord in those circumstances. Habakkuk had the same testimony, of course. Habakkuk 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there is no cattle in the stalls, I, I like the uh, King James Version now in the next sentence, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. And that literally means to jump for joy, to spin around and be glad because of the Lord, irrespective of circumstances. Paul himself outlined this principle in Colossians 3. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then we also will be revealed with him in glory. How? In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, Therefore, no matter what narrow situations, circumstances we may be in, we do not look hard, lose heart, but we look at the things which are not seen. For those things which are not seen are eternal. What we see is temporal, and what we see is unseen. So Paul and Silas could worship in their place of confinement. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, that it is suitable for every occasion that 
we find ourselves in. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would speak and encourage your people who at this time are going through a distress. Lord, in their narrow place, we pray that you would be their Jehovah, their broad, spacious, abundant, fruitful place. Amen. Amen. Let's just Let's start my clock now. <laughs> okay. So this morning we will look at the place of constriction. That place of constriction is a place where life is withheld and we see the importance of the word in those situations. Perhaps the saddest thing, or one of the saddest things for the Lord, is witnessing a believer who has been clearly set free from sin to then become shackled with it once more. What do I mean? As a python seeks to squeeze its victim, so when starved of air, it will die. Likewise, Satan seeks to starve the believer of the word of God, and so that believer will shrivel up spiritually and die. How sad for the one who has been set free by the saving word of God, the living word, to then sink into worldliness once more. We who have been created to fly like the eagle, we end up scratching around in the farmyard like a chicken. Paul says those classic words at the beginning of Galatians chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Hallelujah. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Well, that's fine. True as it is, but how do we accomplish this? Scripture likens this living word that we must feed on, we must feed on regularly to bread. Bread is a staple of many, many diets in the known world. It was said that the Egyptians discovered it, but today I was staggered in looking over this message that there are 315 types of bread in Spain alone. Now lest we confuse what Christ is saying with our implications of what bread is like today, the white plastic loaves, that's completely the wrong image. That's the wrong lesson. After World War II, a stunted grain was produced and that grain of wheat only grew to knee high. It's high in sugars and basically the body can't deal with it. It's laden with gluten. The grain, however, at the time of Christ was not like this. It was called Emma wheat, E-double-M-E-R. It had tall stalks, it bent in the wind, it was far, far more nutritious than the bread we have today. So when Jesus was saying, I am the bread of life, it had an impact we can so easily lose with our view of bread today. Jesus, the living word in scriptures, shows us that he is our food in John 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. The living word, Christ, is also life. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This, of course, is not unnatural. Christ, born in Bethlehem, in Hebrew, Bethlehem, Bet meaning house, Lechem meaning bread. Christ born, the bread of life in the house of bread. And this bread 
that we can feed on as a church. Number six again. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. But I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give uh, for the life of the world is my flesh. What is Christ saying here? He nourishes and his word is suitable for all occasions. As we feed on him, his word, he is everything we will ever need and more. For he is life. In John 10.10 10, we read of that superior quality of life and that super abundant quantity of life. So important is the lesson that Christ is trying to convey to we his church and to his people 2,000 years ago that there are two mass feedings that we read about in scripture. Why two? First of all, there's the feeding of the 5,000 and this feeding occurred to the west of Galilee. This was for Christ's Jewish audience. There were 12 baskets of food left over, 12 being the number of divine government, and also 12 relating to the 12 tribes in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles in the New. What was Christ saying here? He was saying to Israel, I have more than enough bread for Israel, for you all. There was also a second feeding, this of 4,000, and this occurred to the east of Galilee. This was for the Gentile audience, it was set in the Decapolis. And here, there were not 12, but seven baskets left over. Seven times 10, 10 being human government, made the 70 nations known at that time in the world. What was Christ saying here in the Decapolis? He was saying, I have more than enough for the entire world. So to the east and to the west, Christ's two audiences, Israel and the world, he is saying jointly, my resources are inexhaustible for the whole world. However, we read during that time of the feeding of the 4,000, Christ says that without the word, we grow faint. And that, of course, is Satan's desire to starve us of the word. In Matthew 8, we read, If I send them a home hungry, they will collapse. The word collapse there means become enfeebled. That which was strong becomes weak. And it's a picture there of the bond of marriage being broken. If I send them a home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. It's not just like us. We've had a long, tortuous journey to get to Christ and to get to that place of submission to Him. Without the living world word in us, we will relapse back into worldliness. Sadly, as we survey the scene of Christendom in the Western world today, too many churches are hungry, too many believers are hungry and are fainting from a famine of the word. And it is so easy that the word, that the word which we should be feeding on we can instead become as worldly as the world. Separated from our room, Jesus. It is sad. We cannot meet spiritual battles with human resources. We need to feed on him. The word of God is also likened to seed. My ways are higher than your ways. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without 
watering the earth and making it bare and sprout, and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So will my word, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter which I sent it. Grain, the seed, linked to bread. The parable of the sower is not just a Sunday school story. There is profound truth speaking, spoken, sorry, within that message. And sadly, our familiarity with that parable, we can lose its impact. We know, don't we, it speaks of soil and seed. The seed, we obviously know, is the word of God, and the soil is our hearts. Clearly, there's nothing wrong with the soil. Uh, sorry, there's nothing wrong with the seed, the word of God. But the soil, we see, are four types. In Luke 8, we read from verse 5, The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road. Other seed fell on rocky soil, other seed fell amongst thorns, other seed fell into the good soil. Verse 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on rocky soil are those who when they hear receive the word with joy, but these have no firm roots. They believe for a while and in the time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell amongst thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries, riches, pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to maturity. The seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard uh, the word with an honest and good heart, hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So, this sowing of seed, though the seed, the same seed, landed where it went, only one of those soil types produced a harvest. <laughs> that which fell by the road, you know, was trampled underfoot. Satan took it from the heart and the result is that those would not believe and be saved. That which fell on rocky soil received no moisture, received no Holy Spirit, and though they received the word with joy, no firm root developed. They believed for a little time, but when life kicked in, they failed through temptation. That which fell amongst thorns grew, but also the thorns grew too, and later choked that plant. The worries and the riches and the pleasures of life resulted in that seed not coming to maturity and there being no fruit. But hallelujah, that which fell into good soil produced a harvest. That refers to those who hear with a good and an honest heart, and we read in verse 15 that those will bear fruit, 30, 60, or 140. Now, for the gardener, if the quality of the soil is important, for the believer, the quality of the heart is also important. In Proverbs 4, we read, My son, give attention to my words, keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to all of your body. God's word brings life, brings health. Without the word, we live in impossible. 
impoverished, constricted life. And what the Lord seeks to do through us will be constricted, just as the python constricts his prey. The Lord provides excellent seed, the word. Our responsibility is to provide good soil, a good heart. How? Well, we need to look at the gold of the gardener in these Bible times. There are enemies to a good harvest. The gardeners amongst us will know that. Uh, in the Middle East, much of what goes for the soil is rocky and barren. There is much, much work that the gardener has to do. There are enemies to the soil. Thorns, which speak of unbelief. Briars, which speak of our sinful nature. And stones and rocks, which speak of sin and idolatry, all have to be dealt with. In Jeremiah 17, 9, we read that we impose. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Some translations say wicked. Who can understand it? So the gardener, Jesus, has much work to do in our hearts. Firstly, we will look at the soil, the heart. And that heart must be receptive. Uh, those of you of younger age will probably have heard of Alan Titchmarsh. Before him, I can remember a gentleman called Percy Thrower, and he absolutely eulogised over the soil. Even now, I can remember, remember him decades on. The gardener's first job was to remove all blocks and stones and anything that would stop that plant growing. And the ground had to be dug several times, particularly so in the Middle East. In Hebrews 3.12 we read the importance of having a receptive heart. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin hardens the heart. And so, to accomplish this, once the stones are removed, a new heart will be granted. We read in Ezekiel 36, 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove I will take away, I will pluck away the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a kindred heart, a blood-related heart that can relate to God. So, after the soil has been made receptive, it also has to be made wholesome. I suppose today we would say, well, we add fertilizer to the soil. Uh, and those nutrients there will help the plant to grow. But the believer's heart also has to be wholesome. The believer, I suppose we could say the equivalent is holiness through the process of sanctification. The psalmist poses this question. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord in Psalm 24? Who may ascend? Who may go up? And it comes from a garden too. Who may spring up? Who may grow? Who may shoot forth to the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in this holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure, a pure, clear, sincere, a heart empty of sin, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and is not sworn deceitfully. Matthew Henry 
starkly says this in his commentary, purify the heart and that will cleanse the hands. Sadly, no other. I'm there many, many times we take a brillo pad to the hands, but it will not affect the spiritual condition of the heart. We can scrub as much as we want to, no change, because it is his blood and not our blood. Amen. But sadly, we can see in the West today, there's that uh, following on, I suppose, from the putting on the Sunday clothes and being different on a Sunday, and then come Monday morning, we revert back to time. Jesus had the same problem in his day. In Matthew 23, we read, he speaks to the scribes and Pharisees, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, he calls them. Well, he's not going to influence many people like that, is he? That word woe is an exclamation of grief. And the term hypocrites was a term from the theatre. Someone who put on somebody else's clothes to act out the part. And this is what Christ was saying. They are putting on their clothes of piety to act out their religion before man. But inside, Christ goes on to say, you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all unclean. You appear outwardly righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. But we see that purity of heart does lead to fruitfulness. We see that in Genesis 17 with Abraham, where God says, Walk before me blamelessly, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. J.C. Ryle, the Anglican bishop of the 19th century, says it like Tell me not of your justification unless you have also some marks of sanctification. Boast not of Christ's work for you unless you can show us the Spirit's work in you. Sanctification is not a work of nature, but it is a work of grace, as Charles Hodge said. You see, we can't make the soil wholesome apart from doing something to it. The gardener can't just sit there and hope that the soil is going to be wholesome. Man, likewise, can't just hope miraculously our hearts will be pure in one sense. In 1 Corinthians 6 we read, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. So the soil must be receptive, must be wholesome, but also the seed must be well protected. The next job the gardener has to do once the actual seed came above the surface of the ground, was to take those stones and just to place them as a, as a break against the, the excesses of the wind to protect that fledgling plant. In Philippians 4, 6 and 7, we read, Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard. That is a military term. Just as an army would place a guard at a strategic place, that guard will protect what is inside and stop what is outside coming in. That is what is being said here. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Christ, being rich in mercy, will 
effect this change in our lives. But also the seed must be hidden. Have you ever lost anything? Now I don't mean car keys, even an iPhone or a plastic car. I once, believe it or not, actually lost my car. I'll tell you the story. Uh, a friend of mine went started teaching, we went on holiday together and met some friends and then we went up to Yorkshire, when we came back to see a football match, went to Sheffield. Um, Sheffield is built on about five or six hills. The ground was down in the, in the dip. And after the match came out, well, I couldn't remember which hill I parked my car on. How foolish did I feel? Now, I wouldn't mind if that was myself. I could have quite rest it myself. But with friends present, uh, it was more than embarrassing. But that was due to forgetfulness. The hiding that we speak of here is by choice. As the seed, the plant, has to be sheltered from the excess of his weather, so the word has to be hidden in the heart. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that word of God is profitable for every situation. The psalmist wrote, I have treasured, I have stored, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. The word is hidden. Why is it hidden? It is hidden so it will not be lost. In Luke, at the beginning of that gospel, we see Mary. She treasured the word from Gabriel and she also treasured the word from the shepherds. She treasured and pondered that word in her heart so that it would not be lost. It was hidden also so that it could be stored up. So priceless was this word in her heart that she stored it up so that she would not forget it. How important it is to meditate, to learn, to let the word just revolve in our minds. Birds delight in stealing freshly sown seed. Satan delights in stealing the freshly sown word. Once, many years ago, um, I was with a group of people and they said, right, we're setting you a challenge, we want you to learn off by heart, Psalm 91, help. Now I knew at that time, learning that I was at the loss. And it took me ages and ages and ages to actually get to the place where I played this word and I tape and read it. And eventually, the day came and miraculously, I could. And the Lord said at that time, what was a discipline will become a delight. So precious is this word of God within us that once it is stored up within us, no one can take it. Yeah. Open thou my eyes, it's not like a veil, that I may behold the wondrous things out of thy will. I don't know if you know, but there is uh, an early believer in the fifth century who goes by the name of Mary of Egypt. She was a converted prostitute. She at 30, went from Egypt to Jerusalem and thought that with all the pilgrims there, one of the feasts, um, she could indulge herself. And when she went to the Holy Sepulchre Church, in her writing, she said she was barred from going in. She couldn't do it. Couldn't do that. And she felt that the Lord was saying, we have business to deal with. She repented and then entered the church. That barrier was no more. She says in her writings, when I think 
from what evils the Lord has freed me. I am nourished by incorruptible food. I feed upon the word of God who contains all things. But not only does the soil need to be receptive and wholesome, not only does the seed need to be protected and hidden, the seed also obviously needs to be watered. No plant will ever grow to maturity and become fruitful if it is not watered. That is true in the natural as much as it is true in the spiritual. Few can forget the horrendous reports on BBC of the Ethiopian famine in the 1980s where during, during that period, due to lack of water, over a million people died. What is even more tragic in one sense are the countless millions of people who have come to faith but never allowed the Holy Spirit to water that way. Israel is a nation the size of Wales. Try and picture this, but it has the seven climatic regions of the world. In the north, Mount Hermon is clad with snow and ice all year. In the south, in the Negev, it is desert. Rainfall is most problematic. At the most, there are regions that would probably have a uh, about uh, 30 inches of rain a year, and in the south, under one inch. Britain has, on average, about 120 inches of rain. Now imagine Wales, right, with, let's say, a quarter of the rainfall, producing this as Israel did. While farm workers only make up 4% of the workforce here in Wales, we produce 95% of our food. That is Israel. In fact, a report in the local newspaper in Israel last month said, for the first time in 17 years, the Sea of Galilee is nearly full. Water is precious. The Holy Spirit is precious. And so precious is water that had Israel has developed an irrigation system that it has, has uh, taken to the entire world. The water of the Holy Spirit mixed with the Word of God brought life. In Hebrews we read, Hebrews 10. Verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart, a real, true, genuine heart, having the nature of the original, having a heart like God, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Without the Holy Spirit, mixing with the word of God in our hearts, that word will come to nothing. We see this when Christ, an Orthodox Jew, of course, doing what an Orthodox Jew had to do was to go to all the feasts in Jerusalem. He went to the Feast of Tabernacles and each day during the Feast of tabernacles at the temple, water would be poured down off the heights of the temple. That water was called Yeshua, the waters of salvation. And we read in John 7, now on the last day of this great feast, feast of tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who is the word also waters that word. We see that clearly displayed with the Samaritan woman at the well of Sychar. 
The word soika means drunken, filled to excess. So here at the place of excess, of worldliness, Jesus spoke of a spiritual excess, an abundance of the Holy Spirit. I love the King James, it says, needs must I go through Samaria. Samaria was an area the Jews didn't go through because it was, they were regarded as enemies. But we read here in this place of excess, these words, Christ is speaking, but the water that I will give will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That which was barren became fruitful. So then, what can we say? When the soil is receptive and wholesome, when our hearts are receptive and wholesome, when the seed is protected, hidden and watered, when the word of God is protected in our hearts, it's hidden and it's watered, we can be assured that it will produce. We see in Psalm 1 that there is a constancy about this law we will bear fruit constantly. The worst thing I suppose we could have is if you're a gardener, I'm not. Uh, you plant and then you hope. But what a wonderful thing it is to plant and know. Uh, we read, how blessed is the man who does not, and then there's the list of being like the wicked. How blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates by day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. We can be assured when the word of God is in our hearts, and it is watered by the Holy Spirit, there is a constancy of fruitfulness. But also there is longevity. We read that we will bear fruit in old age. Um, I can remember when I was um, when I was in Sunday school, there was a man, the superintendent of the Sunday school. He seemed to be about 110 at the time. I suppose he was he was probably 65-ish. I was 10. But this man, Frank Witts, his prayer life was so rich, even at 10. I appreciated that. He was so gracious. He was good to be around. We read in Psalm 92, the righteous man will flourish like a palm tree. <clears throat> he will grow like a seed that he had been planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God, and they will still yield fruit in old age. Why? They should be full of sap and very green. Sometimes we are on eggshells, aren't we, the people, how they will react to things. This man was so gracious, absolutely even now these decades on, he is a witness. But also, not only is there a constancy of longevity about fruitfulness, but there is an encouragement that even in barren times, we will bear fruit. In Isaiah 48, they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made the water flow out of the rock for them. He split the rock and the water gushed. Even in barren situations, the Lord will water. And as we read in Matthew 7, we should be known by our fruit. It says we will be known, yeah. but we should be known as well. If we are not bearing fruit, 
Nothing wrong with the with the word of God this evening. Perhaps there's something we need to address in our heart. The whole man that the good seed has been received in a good heart that's receptive and wholesome is that when that good seed is protected, hidden and watered, we will. We will. We have to. Scripture says it. We will be fruit constantly in old age and in barren times. In conclusion, we have looked at this time of construction where life, where the word is with help. The only answer to that is that the word must be replaced in our hearts. In Psalm 118, the psalmist who is in that place of distress, we read, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say, his loving kindness is everlasting. From my distress I called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen. Irrespective of his condition, the psalmist's confidence and concentration was on the Lord, and it was to him that he called. There is only one answer for lifelessness and worldliness, a famine of the world here. That is the good seed taking root in a receptive and wholesome heart and being watered by the Holy Spirit. Though initially that might well be quite a discipline, it will become quite a delight. Even in arid, lifeless places we read in Proverbs, how the Word of God would minister to us, even if our physical condition does not change. Proverbs 4. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to their body. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. See, when the word is in our heart, the Lord can do no, no other but to water it. We read, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Wisdom is like a tree of life to those who take hold of it. My son, let not wisdom vanish from your sight, so it will be life to your soul. When the word of God dwells within us richly, even in a desert, we may be an oasis. The psalmist says in Psalm 120, In my distress I crawl, I called, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. So that our testimony, like the Samaritan woman at the well of Sychar, might be, as Paul writes in his letter to Romans, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Even in these different distressing days, the, the good word in the good heart must produce good fruit, even if circumstances in the natural do not change, because this is a spiritual principle from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, for most, of, if not all of us, we have not walked this road before. Strange, difficult, distressing, 
we have things that we want to do. Our time scale, our diary has been put on hold. But Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we, we acknowledge last time we saw the importance of worship. And we also see this morning the importance of your word. Father, we just pray for all in this fellowship. Lord, wherever they are, whatever the circumstances are, we pray that in days to come, their testimony would be that they prevail stronger in the Lord because they grew closer to you. 